Welcome to this lecture about the history of rheology, with a side glance to drilling. First of all, I'm sorry I could not be there with you, uh, but I'm really glad the professor showed so much flexibility and let me hold these presentations uh, remotely. A long time ago, actually in the beginning of time, or about 14 billion years ago, the universe was condensed into a singular point. A microsecond later, the first fluid was generated, a quark, gluon, plasma, or the littlest fluid. Fun fact. This fluid was recreated in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in summer 2015. And scientists have since then shown that this fluid behaved almost like a near ideal Fermi liquid. I don't know what a Fermi liquid is, but maybe we will learn that say, later in this course. A long time ago, or about 5 billion years ago, the Earth was born. It was hot, with molten rocks floating around. But with time the surface cooled down and solid rock was formed. But even though it was solid, it has been flowing ever since. It's just a matter of scale. Chinese scientists has calculated the effective viscosity of the crust in China to be in the range of 10 to the 19th to 20 to the 24th Pascal second. A long time ago, or a few thousand years ago, man came to Earth. Even though they had never heard of rheology, they knew how to use it. We have found ceramic figures dating more than 20,000 years back in time, and pottery for almost the same amount of time. Man knew how to shape this viscoelastic clay and burn it to change its property. We have 10,000 year old wells from Israel, stabilized with rock and pottery, so man knew how to keep the soil away. And in China, we have found deep brine wells, where water was an important part of the construction element. Come a little back to that one. And then not to forget in Egypt, they made water clocks. And we have notes about how Anemet adjusted the drainage angle to compensate for the time-dependent viscosity, sorry, the temperature-dependent viscosity of water. In China, they drilled for salt more than 2,000 years ago. They could drill a couple of hundred meters deep, requiring sophisticated techniques and equipment. Uh, to crush the formation, they used water to soften it first, and then hammering it to small pieces or crustings, mixing it with water to create a slurry that they could then pick up with a hollow bamboo stick and a one-way valve made out of leather. When Bingham founded the American Society of Rheology in 1929, he defined rheology as the study of the formation of flow and matter. But to distinguish it from other engineering sciences, like for example continuum mechanics, it's often necessary to add some clarifying remarks. And in Wikipedia, they're trying with, to, with by adding primarily in a liquid state but also a soft solid, or solids under condition in which they respond with plastic flow rather than deforming plastically in response to applied force. Surely correct, but a bit hefty for me to follow that one. So I, I, I try to stick with the Bingham, the study of deformation of flow and matter, and then add uh, what Barnes says. But Newtonian fluid mechanics based on the Navier-Stokes equation is not regarded as a branch of rheology, and neither is classical elastic theory. So let's look at the modern science where they started to add mathematics into the equation, though still before rheology was formally defined. To begin with, we have Isaac Newton and Robert Hooke's studies on elastic solid and Newtonian fluids. As we have just learned, these are not really part of the rheology, but they are so important leading into the rheology 
and that, that they are impossible to ignore. Hooke found that there were proportionality between the elastic elongation and the applied force in a solid. While Newton stated that the shear rate in fluid was proportional with the flow resistance. From this, it took more than a hundred years until it was really questioned, and the first guy out was William Weber. William noticed that if he put load on silk fibers, they reacted elastically, just as expected by Hooke's law. But if he kept the load, it would slowly, with time, elongate even more. If he then unloaded the fiber, it would shorten immediately just like was known for metal, but then after it would, with time, gain its original length. He had discovered the viscoelastic behavior. Now I tried to illustrate this in a plot, and I'll try to do this with other viscoelastic models that I have later. Uh, with the blue line you see uh, the force going from 0 to 100, and the red line so shows the corresponding uh, behavior. Uh, just from the way uh, Weber explained it, I made the model that you see to the left with the spring and damper system. So you see immediately when you apply the load, the, you have an instant uh, elongation of the fiber. And then slowly the, the fiber elongates until it maximums value. Weber doesn't say so, or at least it, it, the reference to his paper didn't say so, but I'm assuming that it will reach um, a fixed length in the end. And then when we take away the load, uh, it immediately uh, recovers some of its initial length, but uh, the rest of the length has to, to slowly uh, retract itself to the, to the original length. By the year 1845, the Navier-Stokes equation describing the viscous fluid motion was well established. It is a fundamental equation in fluid dynamics and can be used to solve many scientific and engineering problems. A direct deviation from this equation was the hagen poville equation established in 1845. This equation gives you the pressure drop in a laminar flow through a pipe, also valid for Newtonian flow only. So it kind of falls outside of the rheologist's scopes, but still I think this is something all rheologists should know about. Another discovery at this time that had big importance for drilling was done by Henry Darcy. He was designing the water system in Dijon when he came up with the relationship between flow and pressure for flow in porous media. The oil industry was still happily unaware of the importance of this equation in reservoir engineering. They believed the oil was still uh, floating around in between cracks in the rocks. And also they thought that there was so much oil that they were not concerned with optimizing the reservoir drainage. The real research around flow of oil and gas in porous media was not started before the 1920s. But from there on, the Darcy uh, study was important. There was, however, another discovery that caught the drillers' interest. Uh, Fauvel drilled the first well, pumping water through the pipe to bring the cuttings up the annulus. With this technique, he drilled a 170 meters deep well in 22 days, something which apparently was quite fast at that time. In the years that followed, new developments in drilling followed fast, but the next big rheology breakthrough was done by a Mr. Chapman, and he mixed water with mud with the purpose of forming an impermeable lining on the walls of the well. This opened up for the for this also opened up for designing viscosity for better cut transport and for adjusting weight for pressure control. Such was the birth of drilling mud and a whole new industry. Soon after this breakthrough, Mr. Buckingham saw that it would work even better if he replaced water with oil. But interestingly enough, they did not use oil-based mud in oil wells due to fear of contamination or also that the reservoir fluid would be pushed further into the reservoir. Uh, so oil-based mud was an artifact to begin with for water wells only. So 
In 1867, Maxwell did a study on the relaxation behavior of fluid and gases, and he put mathematics to the behavior. He introduced a differential equation describing the behavior of this fluid. Now, I took this equation and put it into the same uh, solver as I did for the Weber fluid, and to the right you can see the response curve under the same loading condition. But contrary to Weber observation, this model does not recover to its original shape. So soon after Maxwell had made this uh, equation, Kelvin and Voigt introduced their model. This is a more solid-like model, but still not a perfect match to Weber. If you look at the curve to, to the right, you see that it's still missing the instantaneous elongation. So, later on in 1878, Boltzmann developed an integral representation of viscoelastic, vis viscoelasticity in full 3D for linear viscoelastic materials using superposition. Phew. What the heck does that mean? Well, with great danger of being wrong, I guess that he kind of created a model using superpositions so that he, this model could be used to describe the models by Maxwell, Kelvin Voigt and Weber or any other model for that matter by just putting these ones together uh, ending up with uh, a single model for, for linear viscosity. From 1922 to 1926 we get introduced to several different models for describing the viscosity of the fluid. Three of the most common are power law, Bingham and herschel broca models. Newtonian fluid is just a special case of each of these three. And in fact, both Bingham and the power law models are just a special case of the herschel broca model. Power law provides a shear thickening or shear thinning effect. Typical thickening effect is what you see in cornstarch, as it gets heavier to stir, the faster you stir. Well, thinning effect is what you find in, for example, hair gel. When you try to roll it in your hands, it gets softer than when you stop and it's more sticky. Uh, Bingham plastics behaves more like a viscoelastic material. As long as the shear stress is below the yield point, or tau zero, as you see in the equation, the material behaves as a solid, while as soon as it starts to flow, it will behave as a Newtonian fluid. If you look at mayonnaise, mayonnaise it might behave like a Bingham. It, it will have some shape, but, if it, but it will also be able to flow. Thixotropic behavior was first described by Kuhne in 1863 when he was studying some muscle cells. But the name Thixotropy was first given by Freundlich and Birkimshaw in 1926 in their study of suspensions. Thixotropy behavior is the property of a fluid to thin over time when subjected to shearing, and to thicken when left alone. In drilling, this is an important and dangerous property. The thickening of the mud prevents the cuttings from falling down when circulation is stop stopped. But if you start to move the drill, path, path, uh, drill pipe after a longer period without circulation, you will have a much thicker mud than expected. And it will require a higher pressure differential to fill the fluid beneath the drill string as the drill string lifts up. As a consequence, the pressure might fall below the pore pressure. And you could get an influx into the, reservoir, into the well by reservoir fluid. Uh, and again, this might end up as a kick. Then finally, in 1929, Bingham and others defined rheology and founded the American Society of Rheology. After the inception, a lot of theoretical work on rheology was concerned with describing the flow behavior mathematically for commercial applications. Differential models, integral type models, network models, I'm not going to dig into these ones, it's too difficult. 
In 1930, bentonite was discovered as the best ingredient for controlling the viscosity of mud. An oil-based mud was also accepted industrially in the industry. The following years, there was an extensive research on mud and it gained more and more importance uh, in drilling. In 1950, air drilling gained a lot of popularity with the introduction of foam. It allowed for faster and less expensive drilling and are still popular today but it requires quite dry formations and are mainly used in shallow depth. In 1947, uh, J.D. Fan patented a viscosity measuring device. Uh, that's 10 years after the first Brookfield Rheometer was sold. But the fan uh, viscometer design was designed to measure the stress at different shear rate and in particular Bing and plastic properties. But it can also be used for Herschel Berkeley parameters. Today it is the best known and most used, at least according to themselves. At the same time a new discovery made by Thoms and Agoston showed that introducing polymeric additives to a fluid could reduce the pressure drop in turbulent flow. Later this was explained by the large extensional viscosity that would damp out the vortices in a turbulent flow. Extensional flow was a separate field of research in the 60s. Back in 1845, Stokes made the assumption of no slip boundary condition. This seems to be a valid assumption for most molecular fluids, small molecular fluids. But possible slip conditions was addressed already in the 30s, and in 1968, Pearson and Petrie showed that if the molecular size are greater than the wall roughness, slip can occur. Still, there are a lot to ex expect from modern rheology. Magnetrheological fluids are fluids that can greatly change the viscosity and subject it to a magnetic field. The property was first noted by Winslow in 1949, but have until recently found but have not until recently found its application. Today, several different car brands use magnetrheological dampers in their suspension system for the sport. Uh, version of the cars. Nanofluid is also a new rheological material with lots of potential, even though the behavior was described by Maxwell already in 1873. Nanofluids consists of a base fluid with a colloidal suspension of nanoparticles. As you can guess, this opens for a vast opportunity of custom designing the rheological parameters. But the most promising property is the thermal conductivity and numerous paper are promising applications for heat exchangers and coolers for different applications. Molecular dynamics is using microscopic simulations on supercomputers to calculate the macroscopic properties. Inception of this was in the 50s, but computer power of today is an enabling factor for this technology. Over the past two decades, a lot of work has been done to build hydraulic models that can predict what is happening downhole while drilling wells. With the use of multidiscipline engineering and where rheology plays an important role. With today's computer power, these models can run in real time and assist the drillers as an advisory system or integrated in the control system that are targeting autonomy. Thank you all for listening and have a nice day.